I'm going to go ahead and get started now. This is not the right thing. Um, just a very short presentation, and it will be followed by one uh, given by Peter Abramovich from UCSF. OK. So Apache CTEX and Python. Uh, the work for this was done by someone at Loyola, and unfortunately, he could not be with us today. So I'm going to be uh, trying to fill in the gaps. All right, so what we want to present today, uh, we're going to compare and contrast all of the Python frameworks for NLP. Uh, then we're going to thoroughly examine the difference between class and type in uh, software languages. After that, uh, obviously, we're going to drill down into the UEMA and then CTAKE's type system to get a full understanding of those. And then we're going to write some code in Python using the new CTEX module uh, in Python called CNEX. And don't believe any of that. OK, so Python NLP frameworks in Python have been uh, popping up in NLP over the last couple of years. Uh, you've got a bunch on the left uh, that decided not to go with the Sesame Street theme. And then you've got a bunch on the right that are generally called Muppetware. But the point is. I think people have been uh, taking up the Python side of things. Um, one, because it's you know new and fresh. Uh, but also, I think Python has an easy entrance for people that don't necessarily want to be full-time developers. Um, and that's kind of good for it. So CTAX is written primarily in Java, as everyone knows. And there isn't really a fantastic way to combine Java and Python code. So uh, are we stuck? Is that the end of the game? I don't think so. Uh, so what we do have is a type system. And Scenic Takes uses the UEMA type system, subtyping that. OK, so there is a difference between type and class. But you know, put simply, using a type, there's no overriding and implementation. So basically, once you have something and you say, OK, give me the part of speech, it's always going to return you a string. There's never going to be some you know, down the stream somewhere in C takes where uh, you have an annotation. And all of a sudden, you say, when, when I ask for the part of speech, return an integer. That's just never going to happen. So. That being given, and the fact that the type system is fully defined in an XML file that can be loaded by any tool in any software language, uh, means that we can kind of cross that, or we can we can build a bridge across this gap between the uh, tools built in the different languages. Some people that have already done that are over at DK Pro. There's a DK Pro project called CASIS. And this is a direct quote from their website. Uh, this library enables the creation and manipulation of CAS objects and their associated type systems, as well as loading and saving CAS objects into the CAS XMI XML representation in Python programs. OK, so what that means is we don't have to try to uh, shoehorn Python code into a Java framework. We don't have to try to similarly take a bunch of java code and somehow get it running in a python wrapper right instead what we can do is we can just save whatever we're doing in c takes as an xmi which is you know a, rep a snapshot representation of the cast that is containing all of the uh, data for the c takes pipeline we save that into a file we can take the Python tool and using DK Pro CASIS, uh, we can read that file that was written by CTEX and create the same CAS, this uh, data object, in Python. 
I hope that made a lot of sense. So really, we're, we're bridging this gap between the two languages by not bothering to do any construction at all. We're basically just getting in a boat and rowing the boat across this river um, between the two. And we can row it in both directions. OK, so it's actually pretty easy to use. This is some code uh, that actually was written by Dima. It's on uh, GitHub. I'll show you the link in a minute. But it's very easy. You just import everything from CASIS. You point it to your type system file. Um, this exists in CTAKES uh, in the type system module. And then from there on, it's really easy if you are familiar with the type system as it exists in Java, it's exactly the same in Python. All of the namespacing is identical. So you can say, I'm interested in this relationship type, I put it in blue, and everything after that is exactly as it would be package and class name or type name in Java. And this will, uh, CASIS will then, basically reach into the type system, see what this is, and it will load this type. And then you can use within this type, this temporal text relation, everything that, every field by name, by uh, address, that you would recognize in CTEX in Java. It's the same exact thing in Python. So if you've been unfortunate enough to use uh, binary text relations, you're familiar with the .arg1 .argument, and you're going to use that exactly the same in Python. Same with .category. If you've done it in Java, you can do it in Python. The naming is the same. So that's it. That was fast. Uh, I'll take one question. Um, but yes, up here I've got the website for Second, uh, CASIS and also Demon's code. There we go. Okay. Okay. Peter says uh, he did the same thing for Ruby a few years ago. I believe it. It's it's a simple concept, and um, it's just great that someone else has gone ahead and done it for us. Honestly and that people have already been testing and working with it, such as Dima. OK. So Peter, are you ready? Great. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, my name is Peter Abramovich. I'm a consultant to a team at the University of California, San Francisco's Bakar Computational Health Sciences Institute. And um, I've been a software designer and architect in healthcare in, in California and internationally for many years. And my role at the UCSF is to advise and implement a high volume a clinical note processing infrastructure within a larger information pipeline. And um, I'm not going to dive into the details of CTAKES, but give a kind of high level technical view of um, how we uh, solve the particular uh, use cases that we had. And I've been really impressed with what I've seen so far in the other presentations and also surprised at how different um, the implementations are and possibly a sign of my own age and and uh, and also my uh, review of some of the cluster uh, orchestration software. Um, we did look at Beam and Spark, um, but given the some of the constraints we had, uh, it seemed like doing something a little bit different uh, might might be the right solution for us. Oops, wrong. Um, so. We're working in a multi-pronged initiative to make a lot of patient data available for research projects across uh, the whole clinical spectrum rather than an individual project. 
And uh, one of the initiatives at the Institute is called Information Commons, and it consists of models and data and data science tools that enable researchers to discover cohorts of patients and work with their treatment data from the over 100 clinics and hospitals that we have around the Bay Area. So if we drill down further, um, the core asset of the information commons is the data mart, which is built from structured patient data and extracted concepts from years of clinical notes that we have over thousands of patients. At the moment, we also have about 80 million notes, similar to sounds like Jeff's project, queued up and they're being Additionally, there's a stream of new notes, which around, uh, amounts to about 1 million per month. And um, as our infrastructure was getting ready and being scaled out, um, COVID came along. And this quickly became a top priority amongst the researchers in our group. And suddenly we were getting a completely new stream of notes. Um, and because these patients were being studied under a different IRB with different regulatory standards, we had basically another queue and a new set of technical requirements. Uh, here's a quick snapshot of some of our design requirements. Um, thinking about that 80 million uh, node backlog plus a million of new nodes per month plus a new COVID stream. And we had some constraints. Um, we didn't have a lot of machine power and we had extremely tight control over intermachine communications and visibility to other UCSF assets. Um, it had to run at full throttle kind of inside of a black box and it had to run autonomously um, for weeks or months, uh, providing some status. But we had a kind of mandatory two-factor um, authentication access across the machines that are within our PHI zone. Um, so that made the use of orchestration managers like Brook Apache Brooklyn, which we looked at, uh, a bit problematic. And we also needed to solve the UMLS authentication issue since the machines that were running CTAKES could not access the internet. And also, um, of course, the problem is uh, we weren't sure how the data was going to be used by the researchers. And so we needed to anticipate different downstream data models and query mechanisms. So we just needed to, to improvise and knew that our researchers would be improvising as well. Uh, firstly, we decided to on a kind of no SQL database paradigm using Mongo. Um, and it's well suited to handling a mixture of millions of text blobs and serialized row-oriented data. And as you know, it, it has amazing performance if it's given enough memory to do its job. And uh, if you're not familiar with NoSQL, then you know when I use the word collection later on, think a, a table of JSON rows. So uh, let me describe roughly what we did. Um, upstream of the CTEX element is an infrastructure that collects the clinical notes from a number of sources from around the UCSF medical centers. These notes are run through a de-identification system that was developed also within the information commons. And I'm sure that that would warrant a, uh, another presentation one day. So batches of notes that are running in the um, high uh, hundreds of thousands or low millions are fetched into the CTEX area. Sorry, I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong uh, slide here. Um, by, they're fetched into the CTEX area by an import process. And one of the responsibilities of this importing mechanism is to prop propagate the deletion of raw and extracted information for patients that after the fact, it was decided that their, da that their data, even if it's de-identified, had to be withdrawn. So. So part of this process is kind of um, is uh, pruning data that has already been extracted. Okay. So we've packaged CTEX as a multi-pipeline web service running in a generously configured machine, but nothing like some of the Spark clusters <laughs> that have been spoken of. Uh, and on another machine, we have a number of very lightweight client processes, and each one repeatedly calls the CTAKES web service with a note and retrieves back the output as a JSON formatted message, which is written into the Mongo repository. And we co-located the client processes on the same machine as the primary Mongo instance to maximize bandwidth. 
And on the machines we have available today, we run one large CTEC server process that hosts multiple pipeline instances, about 30 client, uh, we have about 30 clients on the other machine. And our combined throughput averages at about 16 nodes per second, which is 1.3 million nodes per day. And these nodes can vary from a few sentences to 10 or more pages of really dense clinical language. I think our average is about 7,000 bytes uh, per note, but they, but they come in all sizes, as you well know. Um, and you probably noticed that I also have a UMLS proxy sitting there at, at the edge of the uh, PHI zone. And that's another bit of infrastructure which we've built that serves to relay UMLS authentication requests from inside of our PHI zone to the outside world, um, where it calls the NLM's authentication API. And this is actually used by a couple of different implementations that we have of, of CTEX in our, in our setup. So um, what we did for CTEX, uh, rather than trying to run the single threaded process uh, or use the synchronization that was available of the uh, multi-threadedness that was available within the pipeline itself, is I built a new um, REST implementation using Spark Java. Um, after looking at some of the other REST implementations that were available in the CTIX uh, community, um, and we chose to do our own for stability and ease of modification and for performance. Um, we have a couple of different APIs that will return either the full JCAS or a um, concept level data, which I'll describe later on. And a key choice in terms of the performance on the server side was how the threading would be managed for optimum throughput. And um, as you know, that CTEX native code implements an optional and rather simple approach to threading by using Java synchronization around shared resources. And what I found was that having concurrency control at a really granular level of text processing, processing caused a performance degradation as the server load increased. And our approach was to put the thread isolation at a much less granular level right up at the node itself. So in our CTEX implementation, we maintain a thread pool and each pool member has its own CTEX pipeline and annotation manager. So it uses more memory, but it, we've had no conflicts and no performance issues, no matter how heavily the CTEX process is being hammered. <laughs> um, our modifications also allow the ability to dynamically upsize or downsize the number of pool elements within the available uh, memory according to the size of the document. So we partition off all of our really long notes uh, and run them separately when, we're, when we've kind of configured the server to run with fewer pipelines uh, and more memory. And we also staged another instance of this uh, CTEX as a web service and we distribute uh, client applications to students or researchers that want to process their own notes that are kind of outside this big data mart um, uh, queue. So on the client side, like I said, we opted for running these multiple single-threaded Java client processes that are managed by new parallels. Uh, very simple, very straightforward uh, approach, uh, no kind of heavy computing infrastructure. Um, and to avoid sort of hammering the database for the available nodes left to process, each client reserves a group of free nodes and it works on them without any conflicts until it's done with that batch and then it fetches another batch. So the potential conflict between client instances is reduced only to the moment when they're trying to fetch a new batch. But because of the indeterminate time it takes to process a node and the size of our reservation queue, these are rarely concurrent. So there's very little competition for resources. So from a high level perspective, the total process flow is really tol fault tolerant. Um, uh, like I said, the client process is not concerned at all with authentication that's done by the UMLS uh, uh, element in the server and it's done once per 24 hours per, per user. But in this particular use case, there is only one user. In that other uh, CTEX instance, which is available for researchers, and students, that one does do individual authentication for its client uh, client side users. Um, I know you've had some great presentations on dictionary and pipeline customization and CTEX, but I thought I'd just say a few words too. Um, 
And uh, so we started with the out-of-the-box configuration as far as dictionaries and a standard pipeline. Um, and of course, we noticed, like everyone does, that certain artifacts, uh, concepts that were under and over-specified, missing negations, vocabulary items that have, um, and, and things that have motivated us to start making some changes. Uh, these had to kind of come late in the process just due to our timelines. So as of now, um, we've built a new dictionary that includes the uh, HGNC gene terms, and we've added social and behavioral, behavioral vocabulary as well. Um, we've added a mechanism that prunes or adds synonyms uh, to the main dictionary that, that we created using the dictionary creator. And we're also making use of some built-in but not very uh, heavily publicized uh, capabilities that the uh, uh, that the dictionary lookup mechanism has, which is the ability to blacklist terms, to blacklist concepts, or even case-sensitive manifestations of certain terms. We've also used the, B, the BSV mechanism, um, and we've experimented with different negation tools. And so far, the negex uh, negator seems to be the best performing one out of the box. It has uh, one. Uh, yeah, it has one use case that it does not perform well on where it's kind of too eager and tries to negate everything in a sentence. Um, but I have a I have a, a scheme for solving that and I'm I'm gonna be working on that next year. Um, but that negation is definitely an interesting topic uh, and it's a sort of like a gift that never stops giving. Um, so uh, back to the workflow. So after all the notes of a given batch are processed or at some other milestone that we've configured, um, the concepts are exported into a slightly modified form that's kind of staging database. And from there, they're copied into a different instance of Mongo, which is available to the researchers, has its own authentication scheme and, and everything. So I'll spend a few minutes on what we've done with the output of CTAKES. So within the server I mentioned, that um, we can fetch via one API, we can fetch the whole JCAS. But with another one, um, we do some kind of re repackaging. And so we start with all the classic identified annotations, the medication mentioned, the procedure mentioned, the lab mentioned, and so on. And um, we integrate data from the UMLS annotations, parts of speech, relationship, and so on. And we create these concept objects. Um, and a fully populated concept contains the range text, its offsets, its canonical text, its history and negation statuses, the CUI, SNOMED, RxNorm, and all that stuff. Um, and so the API returns a collection of these concepts for each node. And uh, we're in the middle of some conversations and experiments on the ideal layout of the exported concept data to help the researchers get on with their work. And here, I'd like to say that I really like the idea of using solar as a kind of an exploration tool. It sounds great. Uh, I hope we get the chance to look at it too. So in this slide, I'm demonstrating kind of our flat model um, where the number of kind of concept records per note um, are in the tens uh, of, of records per note. And we also, of course, maintain a separate collection for the raw text and for the note level metadata. And um, you know, some of it's, it's a model that's more familiar to researchers who are used to relational databases, but it has this downside of exploding the memory size of concept related indices and requiring queries to bring records of a given note back, you know, sort of joins to bring the records of a given note back together. And, and our database now has well over a billion concepts. So this kind of gathering is not at all trivial. And it's a billion records, and we're only a third of the way through the, um, our data. <laughs> um, and the other model that we've looked at is a kind of a shallow hierarchy where we, where each, um, each note is represented as a collection of collections in a shallow tree. And um, so there's a collection of concepts of each of the standard clinical domains, sort of diagnoses, signs and symptoms, medications, and so on. And so you can see how it's really easy to pull back the per, per, per note or per patient longitudinal view if you need to do that. Uh, but on the downside, uh, Mongo's ability to query on features of subcollections has a bit of a steeper learning curve. And it gets less efficient in its use of indices um, when you're diving into, into um, subcollections. So um, it's got those disadvantages, but 
On the other hand, those tree of concepts are one to one with the note, so it's it's a it's quite nice to work with. Um, so um, we have a ways to go, kind of in terms of of uh, improving our configuration, but um, we have the information in place to see that our processing is working and it's getting done 24 by seven with a minimum of supervision. I see uh, C takes as a Swiss army knife. I'm sure it's, a, it's an overused uh, metaphor, but you've tried lot, you know, you on a knife like that, you've got lots of blades and tools and the C takes repository has lots of different tools for you to work with. And um, so you just have to find a way of matching the tool to what is in the what's available and what you can configure. I just wanted to say that I had fun years ago. I got stuck in the Nevada desert with an ancient Volkswagen bus, but I found a way of adjusting the engine timing with the Swiss Army knife and a tail light bulb. And I think that um, in the CTAKES repository, you'll probably find a lot of things that that you can use. And we've also seen some really interesting additions uh, from from other uh, software packages to do that. So. And I want to thank this fantastic user community that we have uh, for helping us out, and I'm sure helping a lot of you out as well. And to thank you for your patience, because I know this is the very end of the CTAKES track, and to thank Sean for leading the CTAKES effort and for his infinite patience in handling all the questions that are coming from around the planet. So I'll turn it back to you, Sean. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat, but uh, this is the end of ApacheCon. So this is your last chance to ask questions about anything, um, not just for these presentations, but for anything that's going on the last two days. Um, ask for any other news about CTAKES or what have you. Okay, on the horizon for CTAKES in terms of new milestones. Um, so we would like to get a version five out ASAP. I think there, if you've been watching this week, you've realized that there's a lot of new work, uh, a lot of big items that have gone into CTAKES recently. Well, and by recently, I mean over the last several years. Uh, and um, as Jeff and Jared indicated people want to be able to point to a an actual point release, something that can be referenced. And uh, getting CPIC 5 out there would be extremely important to a lot of people. So I, for one, want to make it happen, but I'm not in this game alone. Uh, everything in CTAKES is done by a team. Uh, and by team, I don't mean just people at Boston Children's Hospital where I work, but you know, around the globe. And to get CTEX version five out there, um, we need to have people uh, volunteer to do some testing, uh, do some documentation, and, you know, give it stamps of approval when all is said and done. So I can't say when that milestone will appear, but uh, like I said, I, I would like to get it done very, very soon. Okay, I'm not sure where to pick up on the chat anymore. Yeah, some of the items, I can't tell whether they're for <laughs> this presentation or in general. It's, they look like they're general questions. Right. <clears throat> Can you use this model to get medical text search using semantic concepts and relation extracted using an annotation? That might be for you, Peter. Uh, yeah, well, OK. Um, probably the the relations between concepts are things that will come later. I mean, 
um, my remit was to build an infrastructure to do that sort of heavy lifting and get through this very large set of notes. And I, I'm fully expecting that um, once the researchers start working with the notes, and especially those researchers that need to kind of reconstruct um, the longitudinal view, that we're going to be making changes, we're going to be, you know, um, fetching more information or doing some options such as uh, saving off this the JCAS and then reprocessing it later on. The the size, I mean, the the, the uh, thinking of storing 80 million JCAS is is a is a very very large, I mean, a, a very large data asset, and. Um, and so that's something I think we would have to look at. To, you know, we'd have to find an active use case in order to do it and justify the uh, from a budgetary perspective. Uh, the question from Gurgana, um, uh, in not in, well, I don't know what the entire UC system is. It's this is the I, the the institute. This is probably a question better answered by my. Manager Eugenia Rutenberg, um, and she I don't she's on the call. She can um, she can put it in the chat box. But this is sort of within the purview of this Bakar Institute, which is mostly involved in research rather than day-to-day uh, -day patient care. We would love to do probably some uh, usage of this in day-to-day -day care, and I have worked on that in previous. Uh, in previous jobs, but but not here. So this is all for retrospective research, I would imagine. So Deb asked if there were any bottlenecks while performing dictionary lookup. No, um, that was the interesting thing. I did some. I I, I um, once I had sort of explored this model of having multiple instances of the pipeline within the same CTX process. I put it through some really heavy testing to make sure that there were no, um, you know, thread conflicts or anything. And there weren't. Basically, I can bring the CTEC server to its knees and still, you know, um, and, and it'll still keep going. Occasionally, as, as uh, was mentioned earlier, an exception will be thrown out of an, an annotator, but not through a thread conflict. These are actually bugs in CTEC uh, itself. Um, but oh, I haven't no. had any thread, you know, a little, but only for very very, very dense notes um, that have certain problems. Uh, so, yeah, it's been remarkably fault. I, I, you know, like I've, I can run through millions of notes without a single problem. Uh, very, you know, like 24 by 7, uh, 50,000 notes per hour without any problem. Oh, I see. Um, uh, looking at Gurgana's notes, um, it might be. But again, um, I'm a consultant, so I don't really have the big picture um, of of how this uh, data mart is going to be used throughout UCSF. So uh, I suggest you contact. There's an address uh, in info commons at ucsf.edu. Um, somebody will be able to answer that question. Sorry, my cat is protesting. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I don't know if that question is for me in terms of performance from um, Debito, um, but uh, we did, I, I did tr prune the pipeline down to make sure that it wasn't doing work that was unnecessary. Um, you know, we started out with a look, trying to find, uh, trying, you know, using the, um, some of the clear TK annotators. Um, and uh, they, that, it turned out we weren't actually, we didn't even need the data that they were generating. And, and I'm very unhappy with the location of <laughs> like other people have been. And so I, I'm definitely looking for a different approach to that uh, because we do try to find the location, but so we've seen some really hilarious mistakes that it's made. Um, so, um, so 
the the uh, I haven't done a methodical look at each of the possible permutations. It's sort of I eyeballed a lot of it and um, in terms of our experimentation with pipelines. Well, I guess if there's no other questions, I, I suppose not. Yes. Okay. So, um, as I've said several times, anything can be posted on the dev list for CTEX and uh, question, comment. That's a you know pretty good place to communicate with uh, everyone that cares. Um, over wine, beer, excellent food. Right. Okay. Um, I think we've had some really good presentations. I'd like to thank everybody that shared their work and uh, knowledge with us. I would also like to thank everybody that uh, took time out of your schedule to watch and listen to these presentations, uh, learn more about CTEX and all of the really interesting efforts that are going on uh, around the world. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.